solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as a trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. Hello listeners. Hope you're having a good end to 2022. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you and your families. This time at the Play to Potential podcast, we decided to try something different. Rather than publishing one more conversation as we approach the year end, we decided to slow down and reflect on some of the key insights that I took away from the various guests in 2022. Hope you'll find that helpful as you take stock of the year and equip yourself for the year ahead. You might have noticed that during the year, we sort of slowed down a little bit in terms of frequency. That's primarily because we are working on improving the user interface and developing the next version of the website. And we're trying some initiatives like the Play to Potential community, which are at the beta stage with a few select people testing it out. So hopefully we can launch these in 2023 at some point and hopefully you'll find them valuable. But now let's come back to the countdown, right? The 10 not really a countdown, but really the top 10 insights that stayed with us from the various conversations we had in 2022. The first one is from Dory Clark. Dory has been consistently ranked in the Thinkers 50 list, often considered as the Oscars of management thinkers. We spoke about her book, The Long Game, how to be a long-term thinker in a short-term world. In our conversation, she refers to how we sometimes have to reinvent ourselves to stay relevant. In that context, I wanted to share an insight that stayed with me, where she speaks about the notion of measuring raindrops when we transition contexts. So what I often will tell my clients when when they do get discouraged sometimes because I mean we all we all want it faster. <laughs> you know, it would be great. Uh you know, when I, I in the book I talk about strategic patience and um Strategic patience is is kind of my uh, antidote to regular patience, which I just <laughs> don't really like at all because it seems so so passive. But um, you know, for strategic patience, you you understand that things are going to take longer than you want. You don't necessarily like it. You don't have to like it, but it might take longer than you want. But you're doing things. You're taking action. You're coming up with hypotheses. You're testing things. You're adjusting it. You're not just like waiting like oh maybe something will happen right and so waiting for the raindrops and looking for the raindrops is is really powerful because i think where a lot of people go wrong is they get so fixated on the final outcome you know which Mm -hmm. in our metaphor here we can call the thunderstorm and that's like oh well it's a new york times bestseller oh well you get to be the keynote speaker at the Mm -hmm. huge conference those things really take a while and it's very easy for us if that's all we're fixated on to sort of um, talk down or to negate some of the smaller victories. You know, it's like, Hmm. you know, well, um, you know, you, you start to, you know, you go from nowhere and then you start to get invited on a couple of podcasts. Well, but nobody listens to those podcasts. Yeah, but, okay, it doesn't have to be Oprah. It's that you went from nobody knowing who you were to a couple of random people knowing who you are. That's Mm. actually progress. Like, you know, I know you want it to be bigger and faster and better, but to understand that to have anybody calling you up and asking you to be on their show, that is a victory. And we need to understand it as such and not uh, get snooty about it, but instead to really appreciate, okay, this is what it looks like. To hmm. make progress. This is what it looks like to be getting there. I think hmm. that's powerful. I find that whenever we pivot to a new space, we often don't have the metrics to measure progress in this new dimension. Dory's nudge to measure raindrops rather than big milestones is a useful guide. This also came up in one of my earlier conversations with James Clear, author of Atomic Habits. He speaks about the notion of the plateau of latent potential, which I find very helpful. You could just look him up in the guest section of playtopotential.com. To share my personal example, about six years back when I embarked on this podcast journey, 
Initially, there was a temptation to measure things like clicks and listens and so on. But very soon I realized that if I had to play the long game, then I had to sort of make that separation between what I wanted to do and the metrics. And if I just kept the podcast progress dependent on the metrics, then this podcast would have died at least three, four years back. Moving on to the second insight, it came from Aisha Birsel, a lady who's an award-winning industrial designer and applies some of the design principles to how we design our life. She's authored the book, Design the Life You Love. In our conversation, I love the piece where she speaks about how Nelson Mandela was a master designer of his life. Absolutely. I think because of the way he reinvented his life again and again, Mm -hmm. and how um, he went from a lawyer and a political activist to being a prisoner and then coming out of prison and going back into politics and then becoming the president of his country. And through it all, I mean, these are major life changes. Mm. And through it all, he seemed to never lose his optimism, his humanity, his empathy um, for himself and for other people. And, um, and how he turned challenges into opportunities. And the, these are truly the, uh, the principles of thinking like a designer that I talk about in my book. Mm. Uh, and I feel like he embodied these and uh, he never gave up mm. and he, he never lost sight of who he was. And he was always at the service of other people. So that's why I thought, you know, his life could have turned in so many different ways, but hmm. he just, yeah, he, he, re, he, redes, he, sorry, he redesigned his life again and again hmm. Um, hmm. without losing sight of his values. Hmm. That, uh, to me, made him a master designer. Hmm. In, I like your choice of words. In addition to all his other qualities, sorry. Hmm. No, I'm you... saying in addition to all his other qualities. One of the things I find fascinating in talking to people like Aisha is the way they see the world. I've seen many adjectives used with Nelson Mandela, but I hadn't thought that anyone would apply the term master designer to him. Of late, I've started paying attention to how people design their life not just how well they manage their career, but how do they navigate the various passages of play as the context around them evolves. This conversation with Aisha brought my attention back to the notion of life design. If you like this, you might also like a nugget from Lloyd Reeb of Halftime Institute, who talks about the notion of being our own chief life officer in addition to whatever title we hold at work. Moving on to the third insight from 2022, It comes from Dan Pink, a prolific writer and a compelling communicator. I love the breadth of his curiosity, which ranges from studying human motivation to studying why the right brain is likely to be more critical in the future than the left brain to studying the science of timing. We discuss his book on regret, where he breaks down the four different forms of regret that humans have. I specifically love the piece where he spoke about the strange paradox, where he mentions that very often, Bronze medalists in the Olympics are often happier than silver medalists. He relates that to how we frame situations in our life. So this is some really interesting research started. um, uh, Actually, the initial research on this came out in 1992. So it's 30 years ago at the Mm -hmm. Barcelona Olympics. uh, uh, Tom Gilovich at Cornell um, and Vicky Medvek, Medvek, now at Northwestern, then at Cornell, did, um, did some really interesting research. And what they did is that they showed, as you say, the photographs of, of Olympians at, at the medal stand. And, they, and what, it, what it showed is exactly what, what, you, what you said. Uh, gold medalists are ecstatic. Bronze medalists are really happy. And silver medalists aren't that happy, even though they got the silver medal at the Olympics. And so the reason has to do with, again, our incredible brains. Our brains are the more I write about behavior and brains, the more I'm just in awe of what our brains can do. I mean, it is a 
it's extraordinary what our brains can do. It's extraordinary. And one of the things our brains can do is something known as counterfactual thinking. That is, we can imagine a, a scenarios that run counter to the facts. And there are two kinds of counterfactual thinking. One of them is called one of them is, is a is a down is a is a is a downward counterfactual where you imagine how things could have gone worse. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I like to, I don't like downward counterfactual. It's too complicated. I like to call it an at least. And so the 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 the, the bronze medalists are like, oh, at least I got a bronze medalist rather than the schmo who finished fourth. He doesn't have any medal at all. So they imagine. So here's the thing. At least make us feel better. And that's OK. That, that's actually a psychological that can be a healthy way of doing things, hmm. a, a, a healthy way of, of, of interpreting events. The silver medalist is saying, if only I had kicked a little harder in the final turn, I'd have won the 100 meter freestyle race. And the that's a that's an upward counterfactual. Uh, if only make us feel worse, but they make us do better. Hmm. And so this is another way of understanding. And so regret is the quintessential upward counterfactual. Uh, hmm. it, it can help us do better. It makes us feel worse and helps us do better. Arguably, not arguably, it, it helps us do better because it makes us feel worse. I find the practice of gratitude journaling quite helpful in this context. I feel it puts us much more in the at least frame rather than the if only frame, as Dan suggests. The other insight I really found valuable in my conversation with him was the point he makes around rifts and drifts in relationships and how we should think about them. Moving to the fourth insight of 2022 that we want to feature, we move to Ravi Venkatesan, who authored the book, What the Heck Do I Do With My Life? I'd spoken to him earlier in the podcast where he spoke about his various transitions from Cummins to Microsoft to some of his social impact work. This time around, we spoke about his insights from his recent book, and I specifically liked the point he made about intangible assets. Look, we, many of us think about our financial assets, but other things like your expertise, uh, your reputation, your networks, your close relationships, your health, your self-knowledge, all mm. these things are even more important and you better be intentional about mm. cultivating these things as well. It's a powerful idea. Very few people even think about it, let alone do it. So that's one manifestation of this multiple forms of capital or assets. Then the Nippon Mehta's um, sort of construct, which is more about when you're giving, um, you're helping, you're serving. It's not just money you bring to it because the world needs uh, much more than just money. Um, so are you bringing love? Okay. Uh, are you bringing energy? Are you bringing expertise? Are you bringing networks? Um, you know, so these are all different forms of capital and all of them are uh, pa powerful and need, greatly needed. And so he comes at when you're serving, don't just think about money. Think about all these other forms of capital that you have that you're bringing to the um, hmm. table. I find it very, very powerful. I find this perspective extremely clarifying when I have to think about impact, whether it's a client situation or in the context of philanthropy. Very often, I notice that we don't quite bring all our forms of capital to bear in a situation and aren't really aware of an intangible balance sheet. I'm a part of a group of philanthropists in an organization called Social Venture Partners, where we pool in a sum of money, contribute towards a few nonprofits, and then assemble teams to help these startups. That's how I got to meet folks at Antarang Foundation and eventually ended up hiring Akash and Arman, who edited the podcast. But once again, coming back, the value proposition of Social Venture Partners to some of these nonprofits is not just about capabilities, but it's really the networks that some of the partners bring in helping some of these organizations access, whether it's talent, whether it's capital, whether it's shared services, whether it's latest IP or something else. So as we think about impact, can we widen the aperture of the lens and see what are the different forms of capital that we can bring to bear in a situation? Moving to the fifth insight, we have Alisa Kohn, 
who's one of the leading coaches that works with startup founders. I really loved the section where she spoke about how entrepreneurs need to consider giving away the stuff they enjoy while building the company. She calls that giving away the Legos. You know, founders start their company to build their thing, whatever that is. And they're excited about the thing they're building. But then over time, they're like less and less close to the building of the thing and much closer to and need to be focused on the building of the company. So founders, I'm just thinking like there's two or three founders in particular that I'm thinking of right now who, you know, they get into the, to the, they get into the startup and they start to sort of to disrupt an industry. And someone I just got off, the, off a call with just this afternoon, he's very excited about all the success. They're, they're completely overachieving their success. They're like a series D startup, not, mm-hmm. you know, really growing up, overachieving. And that's fantastic. But over the past few years, this founder has been focused on being an external voice for the company, fundraising when necessary, attracting new executives that they need to be successful, and really has very little to do with the product itself, with the thing they're building itself. And it continues to be a source of grief for him. Like, as in that's why, you know, like that's what he wanted to do. Hmm. And so the company is succeeding and the company is going to achieve his vision. However, his hands are no longer kind of involved. And it's very um, difficult for people to realize that they have to give away their Legos and then to actually give away their Legos. You know, I spoke to Dennis Crowley, the um, founder and former CEO of Foursquare. Mm -hmm. And what he told me in my book was, uh, which I put in my book, was, you know, first you give away the things you don't like. So he gave away operations and that was okay. He didn't really care about the legal stuff. He didn't want to really budget or, or learn to make payroll. That wasn't his thing. And then you have to give away the other things like sales and like having no connection anymore to kind of the engineering. And then you have to give away product. And that was his baby. And there's like really sad that he had to give away product to somebody else But that's the Legos you have to give away over time. In the case of my own journey, people often ask me if I want to build a team, either on the advisory side, or see if I can get more interviewers and increase the velocity of content at the podcast. And somehow, I find that being a surgeon, for me, is more fulfilling than building a hospital. To use Alyssa's language, in my case, I've chosen to hold on to the Legos, because it gives me joy and meaning and I value the independence and balance that having an individual practice gives me compared to building an organization, which often means there's a flywheel which starts controlling me after a certain point in time. However, if you're a venture-funded startup, I don't think one has the luxury of holding on to the Legos. Moving on, insight number six comes from Thomas Weddell Weddellsberg a well-recognized expert on problem solving and innovation. And I love the emphasis on problem framing. And I really love the example he shares in the context of how we frame problems by using the elevator problem as an example. Well, you imagine that you are the owner of an office building and that the tenants in the building, they are complaining about the speed of the elevator. It's too slow. What many people do there is to take the problem for granted. Okay, the elevator is slow. And then they swing into solution mode and say, how do we make it faster? Do we put in a better motor or, you know, do we just, do we have to go out and buy a new elevator for that matter? What a clever landlord might suggest is instead that you put up a mirror next to the elevator Because, of course, what happens is when people see a mirror, they look at themselves and they fall in love and they forget time. And the underlying idea there is, what problem are you solving? That a mirror is not necessarily a solution to a slow elevator. A a mirror is a solution to the problem that people think it's annoying to wait. Mm. So that's that that it's a simple example. And it really encapsulates that difference between jumping into solution mode going in and trying to analyze the problem, which is asking, why is the elevator slow? And then the crucial difference between analyzing it and framing it right, which is the question, wait, is this really about the speed of the elevator? Or is there something else going on? Is there perhaps 
a better problem to solve. I realized this as a parent during COVID. Like millions of other parents, we had some challenges in terms of digital habits of the kids. Initially, we went down the path of having strong controls in terms of how much time you get on a device, what content you watch and so on. But very soon we realized that if we could engage them meaningfully, then they themselves forgot about the need to play on devices and moved away from the screen. So by framing the situation as how do we engage with the kids better and create sort of physical world opportunities for us to spend time with them was a better way to frame the problem than how do we really clamp down on the digital habits. Not that we've really cracked this problem, but when I spoke to Thomas, I realized that when we're solving a problem, the answer often might lie somewhere else. Let's move to insight number seven that we want to feature from 2022. This one's from Raghu Anantanarayanan, who studied Indic wisdom for several decades and apply some of that to leadership development. For me personally, this was the most insightful conversation I had in 2022 by a mile. Of the various things he said in our conversation, I really loved the distinction he makes between doing and being. See, I was talking to you about the state of Shantam. Na? Mm. That's available to all of us. Mm. When we sleep, deep sleep, we actually get into the state of Shantam, except that we're not aware of it. Yeah, that is when, even biologically, that's when your regeneration takes place, mm. right? That's when healing takes place. Your brain gets reordered and all of this kind of thing happens in deep sleep, right? That is when you get in touch with your being mm. without any external pull or push or any disturbance, right? So in the Gita, when they talk, Finally, na, about sannyasa yogam and then Arjuna goes into battle. He is in this state of shantam. He is in this state of quietude inside while being prepared for battle. Right? So he is not depleting his energies. If I am in the doing mode, I am using my energies and then I have to come back to be replenished. Mm. But if I can be anchored in the being, in the quietness, while I'm acting. I don't get depleted. Right? I can maintain intensity for a long period of time. Mm. Yeah, I can stay in dhyana for three hours, like it is recommended. Mm. Yeah, and I'm sure if a leader can really be in dhyana on his most interesting and difficult problems, he will get insights from an intelligence much bigger than himself. If I link this insight to the realm of transitions and career planning, I often tell people that when we align on what we do with who we are, we start operating in the realm of being, which is replenishing and sustainable. To quote my personal example, when I was an executive search consultant, I realized that of the various things I did, I really enjoyed the candidate counseling conversations the most. But unfortunately, while those conversations are a nice to have, they're not the primary value driver of that profession. I realized that what brought me energy was a footnote of that profession. That led me to go through a period of soul searching to end up with what I do now. It's coming up to seven years after I set up my own practice, but I can definitely say one thing. I do feel that the work I do is replenishing rather than draining. And I'm grateful to be in that position. I realize that not many people have the privilege of being in that spot. I would strongly urge you to listen to the entire conversation with Raghu. It's a bit long, but it has loads of wisdom from a master who studied this over four decades. Now that brings me to insight number eight. This time it's from Tarun Khanna, professor of strategy at Harvard, who's recently co-authored the book, Leadership to Last. The book is a culmination of several years of research where faculty members from Harvard spoke to several entrepreneurs in emerging markets who've built businesses that are thriving across many generations. I loved his pithy response when I asked him about the key leadership traits he and his colleagues saw in some of these entrepreneurs that built to last. You know, we were, uh, Jeff and I were, when we were writing the introduction, uh, mm -hmm. a few pages, uh, I was charged with writing the last paragraph, uh, something that brings the introduction to a close. And I'll read you, um, our summary statement. 
right. which is two sentences. Uh, here it is. Our overall takeaway is simple. We are just humbled by the combination of audacity of intent, humility of demeanor, and steadfastness of purpose displayed by the giants whose life lessons are narrated here. And so I would point to the, the trio of um, phrases that we use, audacity of intent, humility of demeanor, and steadfastness of purpose. So I think the stories here, in a sense, are uh, each and every one of them uh, is an ode to trust, which was the title of my previous uh, meanderings on development in emerging markets uh, in, in their own ways, in their own kind of beautiful ways. Uh, but they've all taken a very long time to painstakingly build. Uh, it turns out that's what it takes to mm. build something that can <laughs> redirect to society. Um, uh, there's a lot of humility in these people. Maybe to some extent they are, they, that's what it takes to build coalitions around you who participate with you to co-create the, uh, as I said in my earlier book, to create the conditions to create with you uh, so that you can collectively be much greater than individual efforts would allow. Um, but they're not shy about what they want to accomplish. And they have big goals. Uh, they want to emancipate women uh, or they want to, you know, cure the world. Uh, they're not shy of ambition, uh, but they're very cognizant of their human limitations and willing to say sorry and reflect uh, on their life trajectory. Um, and they're willing to take the slow and steady long road, which is why the mm. book is called Leadership to Last with an emphasis. So if you look at the cover of the book, the last is the biggest word. Some of my work involves working with people in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Bangalore. When I look at some of the VC-funded entrepreneurs operating there, I find a lot of number one, audacity of intent. But when I look at number two and three, humility of demeanor and steadfastness of purpose, I must say it's a mixed bag. The role models are few and far between. The paradox is that people that often need the most help to fix some of these themes are either blind to it or don't want it. In one of the sessions with the GP of a VC fund that I'm working with, he used an interesting term that I found fascinating. He said that in his discussions with another investor, he came across the term grace in the context of an entrepreneur. When I asked him to elaborate, he said that when you're an entrepreneur, there are moments where you can get away with something either because of asymmetry of information or the power dynamics. Whether it's the entrepreneur in his organization or the entrepreneur talking to investors and other players in the ecosystem. But if you can be that bigger person, focus on doing the right thing even at the risk of hurting yourself, then that attribute can be a superpower in the long term, according to this investor. Then this person went on to say that if I discover that this entrepreneur has grace and has the ability to do the right thing even under distress, then I really double down and invest more in the entrepreneur's organization. I guess there are many ways to cut this, but I found this distinction really helpful in the way we evaluate people but more specifically entrepreneurs. Moving on to insight number nine. This is from Ethan Cross, author of the book Chatter. Ethan is one of the world's leading experts in controlling the conscious mind and is based in University of Michigan. The book really goes into the details of how we deal with the voice in our heads and how we can gain from it without being trapped by it when it goes into a negative endless loop. As part of the conversation, he touches upon how we can be of help to others when they experience chatter. He specifically speaks about how we all should walk the tightrope between letting the other person vent and problem solving the way forward. Finding the right balance is often not easy. Well, I think this is a really important issue because um, in popular culture, we're often told that what you want to do when you're experiencing chatter is just find someone to vent your emotions to just get it out. There's been a lot of research on this process. And what we've learned is that venting can be really helpful for strengthening the friendship and relational bonds between two people. It feels good to know there are other people there who are willing to take the time to listen and connect with us. 
The problem with venting is if all you do in a conversation is vent about your problems, you often leave that conversation just as upset, if not more upset, as when you started. Because all, you, all you've done is, is kept the negative stuff active in your minds. The best conversations when it comes to chatter allow us to do two things. First, it is important to find someone who allows us to express our feelings to a certain degree. Establishing those relational empathy connections is really useful. But at a certain point in the conversation, the person you're speaking with ideally helps broaden your perspective. They help you look at that bigger picture in ways that ultimately allow you to find meaning and reach a sense of closure that allows you to move on. So there's this balance between wanting to talk to people who can both empathize and connect, but also help coach you through the problem. And um, I call those people in my life my chatter advisors. And um, I don't have many, but I have enough. And I think the take home here for listeners is twofold. It's number one, if you're experiencing chatter, be really thoughtful about who you speak to about it because mm -hmm. speaking to anyone isn't necessarily going to be helpful. There are some people in my life who I'm extremely close with. I love them. I respect them. I never talk to them about my chatter because I know that the way that they're going to try to help me is by just allowing me to vent, which isn't going to serve me in the long run. So the people I talk to instead are the three to five people who I know are adept at not just listening and getting me to vent, also helping broaden my perspective. And so I've got those people on my speed dial list, and it's a resource that I avail myself of when I'm struggling. So that's one take home. The second take home is if you are on the other side of the equation and someone is coming to you, a colleague, uh, a loved one for chatter support, be mindful of these two principles. Take the time to listen and connect. But at a certain point in the conversation, when you see your opening, try to help them work through that experience. Now, there is an art to doing this well. I mm. wish I could tell listeners, okay, the thing you want to do is listen and let them vent for 96 seconds, <laughs> and then shift into problem solving. It doesn't work this way. We are way too complicated. To expect it to be that simple, I think, does disjustice to the beauty of the human condition. So the art to doing this well involves taking the time to listen and connect. And then sometimes it can be apparent when you should start shifting into that coaching mode. But if it's not, my suggestion is to ask the person you're talking to, hey, I totally get it, but I have an idea. Can I ask you a question? Hmm. Sometimes I'll pose that question to someone I'm talking with and they'll say, Please, yes, tell me, what do you think? Or where should I, what should I do about this? That's why I'm talking to you. Sometimes I'll be ready for feedback. Other conversations, the person I'm talking to will say, no, just keep looking. I'm not, I'm not ready yet. And you, and that's fine because depending on the person and the circumstance they're dealing with, some people need, may need to spend more time in that empathy zone before they're ready to shift into the cognitive zone. Hmm. But those are the principles of, um, providing and receiving good chatter support. I love what Ethan says. Taking the permission of the other person to come in and say, can I suggest something? Something that works well for me is that in the conversation, I'm often in the listening mode. And then when I sleep over it, I think of a couple of suggestions that could make sense for the person. Then I drop a voice note or an email to get my point across for their consideration. At least in my case, I feel that I'm better when I sleep over things than on the spot problem solving. So that's the way I approach it very often. But I love the distinction that Ethan makes between listening and providing venting as a service to problem solving as a service to someone who's experiencing chatter and for us to know when we cross the line from one to the other. Now moving to insight number 10, the last one we want to feature from 2022. I would say this one's got to be among the top five insights I've gleaned at the podcast over the last five plus years. Now, I've come across a lot of literature that talks about how we engage in conversations and more specifically how we think about feedback. But I must say of all the things that I've heard on this topic, I really love the way David shares his insights around staying on the same side of the net and sticking to our realities. I truly think that if we can implement this one piece of advice in our lives, it can make a disproportional impact on our relationships and happiness levels. Yeah, we start with the assumption, in fact, we say this in the book, 
Carol and I believe you can say almost anything to almost anybody if you stick with your reality. Mm -hmm. In fact, we add, after two glasses of wine, we drop the almost because <laughs> we sort of in our heart of hearts think you can say anything to anybody if you stick with your reality. But being academics, we have sort of uh, cover ourselves. So what do we mean by three realities? In interacting, I only know two realities and you know two realities. So let's take give up you and me. Reality number one is my motives, intentions, which leads to my behavior. Reality number two, my words, my nonverbals, my tone, etc. The third reality is the impact on you. How does it affect you? So the model is similar to the McKinsey model, but we, I think, elaborate a little differently. And what we say is, I know two realities, my motives, and I can see the behavior. You know two realities. You can see the behavior, and you know the effect on you. But you don't know my motives, and I don't know the impact. But I need to know the impact if I'm to be affected. So we then envision a, uh, we actually envision two tennis nets, but I'm going to talk about one. Mm -hmm. The first one is between my intentions, motives and intentions and my behavior. The second net is between behavior and your effect. But let me focus on the first. Mm -hmm. As in tennis, you can't play in the other person's back court. We often get into trouble so frequently and conflict gets worse because you, the recipient of my behavior, don't stay on your side of the court. So think of how much or what uh, feedback is so commonly used in organizations. We say to somebody else, well, you just don't want to be a team player. Uh, you just want to put your own area. You, you don't care about uh, me or, or my area. Uh, you just want to dominate. Well, you're over the net because you're making statements about my motives and intentions that you don't know. It's a, it's a story you're making up. Hmm. And so when we say, stick with your reality, you could say anything. Let's uh, imagine that um, you're now feeling uh, a little tuned out because you're experiencing me as giving you more information than you want. So if you were to say, well, David, do you just want to show how smart you are? I'm going to get defensive. But the other problem with that is I can just say, no, I don't. Hmm. And it has little impact. But if you stick with your reality and you say, David, I'm feeling bothered and I'm feeling a little tuned out because mm. I'm experiencing you as going on and on and talking too much. Mm. Now, now, I can't say, no, you don't, mm. or I'm over your net. Mm. You no, know, I'm likely to say, well, I'm sorry. That's not my intention. I'm trying to be helpful. And you can say, well, I'm glad you're trying to be helpful. And I'd like you to be helpful, but the way you're now acting isn't helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And now we could have a conversation of how I can be helpful. And so much of conflict is accusations, uh, making up these stories, and people not sticking with what they knew, know, which is, this is how I feel. This is how your behavior is impacting me. Mm. And this is how it's getting interfering with our relationship. I hope that you found the compilation helpful. We really look forward to bringing some of the new initiatives to you during 2023. As I said at the outset, one is a significantly improved version of the website, which will help you get to what you want more efficiently with a better search functionality. We realize that the current UI has a lot of room for improvement. We've been working on it, and that's one of the reasons our frequency has dropped in 2022. We're also trying out a play to potential community that's currently in beta testing mode with a few select people that were kind enough to offer their time. As you would appreciate, 
I've gained a lot from the podcast in terms of the learning and in terms of the trust people have been able to build with me and my work. If you're deriving value from the podcast, my only request at this stage is that you consider paying it forward by contributing directly to Akash and Arman who are the editors of the podcast. Currently, they operate like the chef in the kitchen who the customers never get to meet. You can just drop them a line of appreciation for the work they're doing or contribute to them directly. You will find the link in the show notes. Wish you a merry christmas and a happy new year. Have a wonderful year end and see you in 2023.